Montana. Two people per square mile. It's wild, it's huge. And here, only the toughest can survive. Rick and Nathaniel are big game hunters. For them, every season is the start to a new adventure. Fun, excellent. Scott and Jerry know the mountains better than anyone. They are trappers and proud of it. I think I may have got one. The Hollenbecks and Arthens have maintained their family ranch for generations. And they're ready to do whatever it takes to make it last for generations to come. I'll get the last one. Welcome to Montana, the land of the Wild West. Got a kitten track. OK. Oh my gosh, big herd elk. Wow. Soft as a flannel diaper. These are powerful little traps. Whacked. You see? Woohoo! Moving now, buddy. That's how it is around here, I guess. In Montana, there are strict rules for wildlife hunting. During the winter, only a few species of large predators can be hunted, and only in accordance with the quotas set by the government to regulate their population. Among them, one of the most difficult to track is the cougar. Here, it is called the mountain lion. In the southern part of the state, in the heart of the Beartooth Mountains, the Montana authorities evaluated and determined that only five mountain lions are allowed to be taken by hunters in this region for this winter. And Casey is one of the best mountain lion trackers. This year, he's trying his luck with Rick Metzik, an old big game hunter. But on their first attempt, Rick unfortunately broke his quad on the middle of the mountain. The two hunters were forced to abandon their hunt to Rick's great despair. You know, this really sucks. And the return of the hunt also did not go as planned. The rear transmission of his quad completely exploded during the expedition. When I got back from the December hunt and got my ATV in the shop and tore things apart, found out that some serious stuff had come undone in there. I wasn't able to get the parts I needed at that time, and I still hadn't been able to repair my ATV. But for Rick, the failure of the quad was not the biggest issue. He was most disappointed that he didn't find a mountain lion, an animal he has not yet had the chance to hunt. I've hunted pretty much everything in North America, varmints, fox, coyotes, birds, ducks, geese, antelope, deer, buffalo, pursuing a mountain lion. It was a new challenge. I was anxious to try to be successful at that. After the first hunt and with the failure of my ATV, that was a disappointment in itself, but it was kind of a like an appetizer to want to do more and I mean, we've barely scratched the surface of what lion chase and lion hunt is all about. But Rick is not the type to give up. This morning, Casey offered him a chance to try again. And this time, the weather conditions are ideal for a mountain lion hunt. It snowed the past several days in the mountains, and this thick layer of fresh snow will allow them to easily spot the animal's tracks. Rick visits his friend Stacy, who lives near town. Stacy offered to loan his ATV specially equipped with tracks, perfect for these kinds of conditions. 
So I, I suppose I'm going to be indebted to you forever for the use of this. <laughs> What's uh, the tricks to this? All right, I'll get on there. Oh, all right. Oh. All right, here we go. Oh, the on off? Thing. Yeah, that's it. All right, and this will be the starter. Pack it out, and then we'll go get some gas. Do I look good? No. What can I do to make that happen? You lost that years ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll see if I can get there from here. All right. You on a ride? No. <laughs> Rick has to bring the quad to the other side of the garage to fill up. Using humor as a mask, the hunter doesn't want to show how unsure of himself he really is. He's the same. <clears throat> OK, I think I'm going to move. Well, then get out of the way. You're there. How's that, huh? Now, I'm going to have to show you how this dog likes to run. He gave me a demonstration of what it would do and how it would do, and I was totally impressed. He flew around there like some kid at the racetrack. I think he could probably climb a tree with this thing. After this little trial run, Casey joined Rick, and the two hunters are ready to go. Thanks so much You're for welcome. the use of your machine. You're welcome. You guys have fun. Well, we'll try. For Rick and Casey, this is the beginning of a new adventure to find a mountain lion in the heart of the Beartooth Mountains. Meanwhile, about 10 miles from the little town of Jackson, Scott Olson is getting ready for a hard day. Yesterday, when he went to pick up the traps he had placed at the other end of his property, he noticed that one of his fences had been broken by a moose. Undoubtedly, this served as a barrier to his momentum. A moose can be more than two meters high and weigh up to 1,500 pounds. More often than not, the animal moves along at a quick walk or trot, but when it launches into a gallop, it's able to exceed 30 miles per hour. The moose is an animal built to travel through the snow and is an animal that can get over those tall fences fairly easily, even better than a horse by far. But they also are kind of hard on the fences, which is one of the reasons I went with the uh, log jack leg fence in the first place, because it holds up much better overall than a barbed wire fence that the moose just trample down. But occasionally, a moose, just to irritate me a little bit, will knock one of those poles or break it. It took Scott three years to build this huge wooden fence, and he's extremely proud of it. Thanks to this structure, he's able to allow his two horses, Ghost and Cochise, to roam free around the property. As soon as he discovers a break in the fence during one of his outings, he immediately tends to it with his tools and chainsaw. Part of living in the wilderness is abiding by their rules. And when a moose takes down a fence or trees fall on the fence, it has to be repaired regardless of rain, snow, sun, sleet, or conditions. So you pick and choose your battles. I pick to do it in the daylight. With a moose knocking down a pole, they not only do the damage to the fence, but they create a trail. The horse sees the trail. They'll be drawn to that area and want to climb over that fence. Then I gotta go catch the horses out in the wilderness that's not fenced, and that creates a real problem. I might lose the horse. I might have the horse die of starvation out there. There's nothing to eat out there. When nature shows you a problem, address it, move on. To get to the fence faster, Scott decides to cut through the woods. But as usual in the wild, everything doesn't go as planned. A tree blocks the path that Scott needs to take, and what was to be a shortcut turns into lost time. In the winter, 
occasionally you'll get strong winds come through, especially with these storms, and they'll drop trees. The forest is very dense in this area, so being on snowshoes and with all that snow, it's impossible for Scott to get around the obstacle. Fortunately, he has an asset with him, his chainsaw. But he first has to detach it from his sled, and he can't be in a hurry to do that. Everything just takes a little more time in the winter. It's just uh, one of the things you live with. You kind of learn over the years, though, what kind of knots to tie that'll come loose because you're gonna have to undo these ropes when it's cold and things don't work as well. So a little foresight can save you some aggravation. Even uh, simple motions such as turning around with snowshoes on is a lot harder. And so every step you take just requires a little bit of thought and stability. What uh, lends a little bit of danger to this is the fact that I'm on snowshoes, so I have to make sure as I'm cutting this that I have freedom of movement because I don't have the ability to jump out of the way of a chainsaw that uh, may bounce around. So we're gonna go about it slowly and precisely and get this cut. Problem solved for Scott Olson. It's time to hit the trail again. The evening is approaching and the fence absolutely has to be fixed today. At the same time, further north, in the city of Great Falls, Montana's biggest rodeo champions compete for the final competition of the season. Henry and Sarah arrived in town that same morning after a six-hour drive from their ranch in Moult. They came with their son, Rhett, just nine months old, who's going to see, for the first time, his father compete. The competitions will last for three days. This first day allowed all the competitors to warm up in a relaxed setting. But tonight, things will start to get heated. The stands of the Great Falls Arena are packed and the atmosphere is tense as the first night begins. In a few moments, it will be Henry Hollenbeck's turn to enter the arena. He's the man to beat. At the moment, he's the leader. Henry is about to compete in tie-down roping, during which the cowboy must catch a calf with his lasso, turn the animal over on the ground, and tie three of its feet together with a rope that the competitor keeps between his teeth. All that as quickly as possible. Again this year, Henry is first in the general ranking at the end of all season rodeos. If he completes his three events without taking too much risk, he should be able to retain his title. Just catch, try to be as fast as you can, but don't do anything stupid. With all his years of competition behind him, Henry has become known on the circuit for his reliability and consistency. And that's what people see in me, that that guy never misses. All year long, you know, I'm not the fastest guy out there, but more than likely, I'm gonna catch. I'm not gonna win first every time, but I will place. And that's what I want people to see in me. That's what I strive for, is I'm gonna catch every cat. In the arena, the audience is anticipating the champion's run. Sarah's starting to get more stressed. She sits alongside Henry's parents, who've also traveled to Great Falls for this. I swear I get more nervous and sitting in the stands than he is on that horse because I know how much that sport means to him and you gotta be on your game every night at that circuit finals or else, I mean, you're not gonna, you're not gonna leave a champion. This man, Hank Hollenbeck, all around champion of the circuit, tied out For Henry, the time has come to enter the arena. After opening the gates, the calf escapes at high speed. 
in just three seconds, like a long repeated choreography in training. Henry throws his lasso to land perfectly around the animal's neck. But the speed of the toss caused the lasso to completely miss going over the calf's nose. And as Henry jumps from his horse, the calf raises its head and manages to escape. When he went out and he missed that calf, I thought, oh no. In the bleachers, all is quiet. The champ is devastated, and no one really knows how it happened. It just barely missed his nose, and it was heartbreaking, because that was the sellout crowd. That's when everybody was there, and I kind of failed myself there. I feel ashamed, and I feel terrible. It was my little boy's first circuit finals. Henry doesn't score any points on this run. The title will be determined in the next two rounds. And this time, Sarah knows Henry cannot afford to make any mistakes. What I was most worried for was if that got in his head for the following nights. And I was just praying that like he could just put that one aside and still go out and do his best the second and third night. It's the end of the first round for the competitors of the Montana State Finals. After months of competing and traveling to rodeos organized across the state, the championship will be determined on the last two days of the season. In the small town of Ennis, Jerry Clark, the trapper, just finished his trapping season. All the animal furs he collected during the winter are now in his workshop, ready to be sold at auction. The old trapper spent several weeks in the mountains near Quake Lake, an area he's particularly fond of and where no one else dares to venture. While examining his traps, he felt that this season was not like the others, so he decided to remove his traps earlier than usual. Trapping was a challenge this year. I didn't do a lot of trapping. Due to the number of animals and the animal sign that I was seeing in the area I was trapping, I didn't want to trap it real hard. It looks like we're in a down cycle, so it would take it a little bit easy for a year to build our numbers back up. But Jerry still managed to collect some nice pieces that should sell well on the fur market. The word on the market this year was that long fur was going to be in demand. So I primarily went after coyotes. Trappers are often called on by ranchers to lay traps for coyotes. The animals cause a lot of problems for ranchers during the birthing season. They can get a young calf or a young lamb without much problem. They can raise heck with the ranchers. So the ranchers will sometimes, if they're having a coyote problem, they'll call me. They want me to come out and take these coyotes out. And uh, I'll go get them for them. This season, Jerry caught seven coyotes in his traps and a few other animals whose furs will also be sold on the market. We got three red fox. This is a ermine, long tail ermine, skunk. The price can vary greatly depending on the species, but also because of the quality and color of the fur. I've got three bobcats here, kind of on the small side, but they'll bring a good price to market. The bobcats in this particular area of Montana are the best bobcats anywhere in the United States. I've sold bobcats for $1,700, whereas other places like Kansas, Nebraska, Texas, average on bobcats is probably $30. These guys here, these are my pride and joy. But this year, the animal that Jerry targeted as a priority is the pine marten. Very fashionable on the markets, but extremely difficult to catch. All right. And Jerry's probably one of the best marten trappers in Montana, and maybe even in the entire United States. They bring a good price because there's not a lot of them caught. You see how his fur is nice and dark and even all the way through? You can match these marking up to make coats out of them. 
See, these two Martin are almost all alike. They could very well be family members. If you have a nice Martin, top quality, extra large, dark Martin, you can get up to 250 bucks for it. Jerry sends his furs directly to a Canadian company specializing in selling furs from North American trappers. You never know what you're going to get. But these international fur auctions, they have a lot of foreign buyers. Russia, China, Greece, Italy, Korea. There will be several million dollars worth of fur at this auction. It's the biggest sale of the world. So we hope we'll do well there. Bag these guys up. Hate to see those fur leaves a shock. You know, I enjoy going out there every night, working on the fur and feeling the fur and looking at it hanging. So I bag it up and ship it. I mean, it's kind of a down day. It's really a down day. I'm, I'm sad for a while. But then, you know, that's the way it works. That's what you got to do. I don't like to see the fur leave, but I like to see the check come in too. For Jerry, it's time to separate from his furs and send them to Canada. In the Beartooth Mountains, Rick Matzik and Casey Kircher are ready to embark on a mountain lion hunt. In Montana, the hunt for mountain lions is done with dogs, specially trained to track animals. This kind of hunting can be long and very intense because this feline is one of the most agile animals in the mountains. Its racing speed can reach 50 miles per hour. It can jump rocks and climb trees. There's no way a human can actually keep up with a mountain lion. Mountain lions run way too fast for a human to catch. Dogs are the only way to go when we're hunting mountain lions. Their nose is absolutely incredible, what they can smell. Just their agility, too, is amazing. There we go. The principle of stalking is to let go of the dog as soon as the hunters find a track. The job of the dog is to catch up with the cat and force it to take refuge in a tree to give the hunters time to get there. When the dogs get close to the lion, you can actually hear them and you're close enough to hear them. They have a certain bark or a bay is what we call it. And that's how we determine whether they're treated or not. Casey hunts with his dog, Cash, one of the best mountain lion dog trackers in the area. Cash is equipped with a GPS collar that allows Casey to keep track of his progress while tracking once he started on the mountain lion's trail. Now the radio collar you got on, what kind of range you got on that? Nine mile. Nine? Well, line of sight, that's nine miles. Okay. So if he gets like... How does it work if it's down in a canyon or... It'll lose... It'll lose it. Yeah, but it still keeps the track on him and I can tell where he's been at, so... All right, now like on terrain like this, if we get up there and, and cut a track, you just turn cash loose on the track, mm -hmm. and then what do we do? Position ourselves? We'll wait, and I'll, I'll watch the GPS and kind of see what's happening. All right, while you lead on, I'll follow you. <laughs> Rick and Casey begin to survey the area in search of fresh mountain lion tracks along the trail. During the first hours of the day, they don't find anything, but the odds are about to turn for the two hunters. After we got up to the top of the mountain, we determined, well, there's nothing up here, so we went back down, and I was, we were on, en route to check another place, and I got a phone call from a buddy that said he had a nice tom track over on his place. When Casey got the call from his friend Norm that he'd found a fresh lion track back behind his ranch, at that point, the excitement levels raised. Well, are we ready? Cash, are you ready? 
He's ready. He's ready? With their two quads, the hunters are ready to face the adventure. Together, they're now heading to the place where Casey's friend Norm spotted fresh tracks at the edge of the wood. Once there, the excitement of the two dogs begins to climb a notch. There are mountain lion tracks all over the place, and they are very promising. Rick? Yeah. Did you see these ones? No, I didn't. I knew right away that, yeah, we had a nice cat to go chase after. Well, this is lovely. Yes, it is. That's Just big. lovely. Maybe 150 plus pounds. A big male, the most popular prize for a mountain lion tracker. And according to the tracks he left in the snow, the animal must be nearby. I could tell it was really fresh because we had fresh snow that morning and the track was fluffy and it wasn't melted at all. So I knew it was within a couple hours old. And we could have a pretty good chance of getting it in the tree. It was a really, what they call a hot track. I mean, it was very fresh. It was within two hours. At this point, it, again, the excitement levels raise another notch. It doesn't come much fresher, does it? No. They're turning the dogs loose on them right now. So the dogs are on the track now. There we go. Fun. Excellent. No time to waste. The dogs are released, and they're already on the trail of the animal. With fresh snow and a fresh track, the dogs can pick up on the scent a lot easier. We were definitely in a hurry, because it's exciting. <laughs> Letting loose on a lion and getting to chase it around the woods, it's, yeah, it's exciting stuff, especially if you haven't done it before. And even if you have, it still gets to you. Right in the heart of the Beartooth Mountains, the mountain lion hunt begins. In the Big Hole Valley, Scott Olson arrives at the place where the fence was broken by the passage of a moose. He is obliged to repair it as soon as possible, otherwise his two horses might escape. Horses have a short memory. They can't always remember how to come back over, and they would just go to parts unknown, like over the divide, or over that divide, or over that divide. And then you've got a real problem on your hands because there's no food out there. But the big layer of fresh snow that fell during the night will make Scott's mission even more difficult. Not necessarily the kind of chores you want to do when it's 30 below zero outside. When you find problems out on the homestead, such as a fence being down, the feelings that you feel is one of a little bit of despair because it's not what you planned on doing or wanted to do, and yet realizing that you've got to do it right now. You have no choice. This is what you've been given, and that's your life. There's no time to waste for Scott. He knows the day is short. I have beat down a little platform here. The name of the game is preparation, because I'm going to bring a pole over, and I want to be able to walk on top of the snow and not be getting buried. I need to measure how far it is from there to there. So I'll come over here and put my snowshoe where I want and do natural steps. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six steps will do me. You don't want to go five because there's nothing worse than getting here with five steps and being a foot short. But for Scott, the Big Hole Valley still provides an advantage. One doesn't need to travel very far to find the right materials to repair a wooden fence. And we're gonna look for a butt end of about uh, five inches, four to five inches, it's more or less uniforming. I wanna cut a green tree because that will give me another 
five to 10 years of service on that rather than a dead tree, which is already dead and it will rot faster. So as I'm looking through the forest here uh, on the place, I'm in the middle of a, what we call a dog hair stand of lodgepole pine. They're called lodgepole pine because lodgepole signifying the poles that the Native Americans use to hold up their lodges. So they're very uniform, thin shaped, they're very long and they taper nicely and they're easy to uh, cut down and, and readily available. And so these trees, uh, when they are close together, they're very long and slender and just like an arrow straight. For Scots, this forest is the perfect place and it doesn't take long to find a tree that should do the trick. As you can see, it's really tall. So I'm gonna cut the length I need and it's green. I can see up on top the green pine boughs. Now the problem is, this is kind of on a hill, so I want it to fall out. But falling a tree is not an exact science. And as I get it cut, I'm gonna to try to push it to where I want. So I'm gonna beat down an area here so I have a good platform to work on. And if I need to get out of the way of the tree, I can get out of the way of the tree and get my saw out of the way. And that's the other thing about snow. You can't move as fast as you can on dry ground. So do some preparation, take your time, and it'll go as best as we can. Voila. Two, three, four, five, six. Successful operation. The dimensions of the trunk seem perfect. Scott has one last thing to do, and the fence should soon be repaired. Meanwhile, further north, in the town of Great Falls, Henry prepares for the last day of the season. In Montana, it's called Championship Sunday. They call it Championship Sunday because everything that you do all year long comes down to one day. After receiving zero points on the first day due to his lasso failure, Henry catches up again on the second day. Because of a good score in steer wrestling, during which the cowboy has to catch a steer, He's still in the race to win the championship. After nine months of competing, Henry will fight for the title on his last event of the season. I knew I had something to prove to everybody and myself. I was the second roper out to compete. So I said, well, I just got to be as fast as I can and hope I win first, you know? This time, Henry flies and leaves no chance for the calf with a time of 9.6 seconds. I made a good run. The calf kind of gave me a little bit of a fumble right when I went to flip him. You know, it cost me maybe two tenths of a second and had a good smooth tie and I felt good and felt consistent. I knew in my mind that I had a chance of winning. But there are still 10 competitors left to go. The suspense is palpable in the arena. And at this point, no one knows who will be the champion. I had to watch all the other 10 guys go. And I was more nervous then than I was when I competed. Just because you had to watch the different scenarios play out. You know, if this guy does good or if this guy wins first, how much money is he going to win? 
I was getting kind of worked up at the end because they hadn't announced if he had won it yet because it was so close, so they still had to crunch numbers. And so I'm over there in my head, like, crunching numbers, like, oh, he has it, maybe he doesn't, maybe he does, ugh. And so I went and found his father in the stands, and I'm like, what do you think? And he's like, Sarah, you just gotta let it all pan out, and whatever happens, it'll happen. And I was like, okay, you're right, calm down. <laughs> It's time for the judges to calculate the scores from all the events so they can reach their verdict. The tie down roping and the all around winner, the year end titleist. I believe for the third consecutive time from Moat, Montana, Hank Hollenbeck. And with a purse of $23,400, it's Henry Hollenbeck, nicknamed Hank on the circuit, who wins the title. I just won the all around. It was a close race. Had a good day, but it's been a long weekend. Wish it started now, but it's ending. Henry left with the championship saddle for all categories, but most importantly, with the pride of winning the title in front of his sons. Anytime he gets to take a saddle home from that competition, you know, he's worked his butt off for it. And it wasn't just about that weekend, it was about that whole summer of him um, going to rodeos and working hard and, and just the accumulation of the whole season. Very happy, very proud, and it was even more special to have our son there with us to share that. That was Rhett's first circuit finals rodeo. I mean, he was in my belly the previous year. For the Hollenbeck family, this is the end of a very hard and long weekend of emotions. And now it's time to get back on the road. We gotta go home and get ready for lambing and uh, start ranching all over again. Just get back to life as we know it and feed animals in the morning. Next year, Henry will once again put his title on the line, so his competitors have to work hard. The veteran's not going to give it away easily. Back in the small town of Ennis, Jerry Clark, the trapper, sends all of his animal furs that he's collected during the season to Canada. They'll be sold at auction in a few weeks. The gems he's carrying in the big white bag just might bring him several thousand dollars. You never know what you're gonna get. I've had 10, 12, $15,000 years. Good morning, Mark. How's it going, man? Good, you got a handful. Another year of furs, headed to market. What's the weight on here, Jerry, you know? Uh, 27 pounds. Right? Yep. Yep. Okay. What kind of furs you got to ask for? We got uh, coyotes, fox, marten, bobcats. Good haul. Good haul. Hope the market's good this year. Okay. All right. Good to go. Got it. All righty, man. Good to see you there. Good luck. Yeah, good seeing you. Take care. Got rid of the furs. They're on the way to auction. Now I just have to worry about what price they're going to bring. But I'm not too worried. My furs always bring good price. So I have to wait another nine months now to start another season. But I'm looking forward to it already. It's the end of the season for Jerry Clark. Next year, as soon as the season opens, he'll return to the woods because that's where he feels best. He is a Montana trapper and he intends to stay that way for a very long time. Everybody knows that I'm a trapper. I like being alone in the woods. There's things out there that can hurt you, but if you keep your mind about you, you can survive here. Uh-huh, all right. I like the wild, and Montana is wild. One of the few best places that's left. Its rivers are wild. It's Mountains are wild. This wildlife is wild. And some of the characters here are wild. I'm one of them. 
I don't think I could ever leave Montana. It's just, it's me. That's it. In the Big Hole Valley, Scott Olson has to finish repairing his fence. He was able to saw down a tree with a diameter that seems ideal to replace the log that the moose ripped off. He just has to check that the length is right. And it works. It's clearly obvious that this is not Scott's first time fixing a fence. A lot of people will see you do chores out in the woods and they'll say, he looks so comfortable, looks so easy for you. That came from failure after failure after failure, trial and error. Learning what you need for a certain project and doing it so many times it becomes repetitive. We've got a barrier now to the moose. Put that on with some ring shank spikes. It's got a good, solid diameter. It's green, so it's gonna last a while. And it's nice and high, so as the moose comes up in the snow, it's not gonna have the ability to get over as easy. So all in all, it was a, a good day in the woods. I'm tired. It's time to head for home. After several miles on snowshoes, two fallen trees, and a repaired fence, Scott Olson's day was certainly not a restful one. After you finish a job that you've had to do that's taken extra time, extra effort, extra planning, perhaps the snow conditions are miserable. It's cold, it's wet, windy. It is what it is. You kind of feel like you overcame nature just a little bit. You lived with nature and you came out the other side wiser and a victorious. I would say the victories in the mountains are made up of a bunch of small victories that overall add up to success. So therefore, overall, you feel that contentment with knowing, I'm still here, throw another wrench at me. I'm still here, nature. It's the end of the day for Scott Olson. He can finally go home, but he'll have to keep a close watch on his fence throughout the winter to make sure that his two horses can't escape. The mountain man knows what it takes to live life in the Big Hole Valley.